early detection is the way that you can ensure that you have the best quality of life. You know what I mean? Like, I, I know that if my cancer wasn't found as early as it was, my, my reality wouldn't be what it is now, you know? And so me, as a black man, as a prostate cancer survivor, I'm just here to tell men everywhere, but certainly men who look like me, that doctors are here to help us. Can you um, let us know what and how old uh, were you when you got diagnosed? 37. So young. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and I know there's a, there's, a, there's a bit here too about the screening, right? We talk, if we talk about the screening, that there's different guidelines depending on different factors. Um, yes. And so like the recommendation uh, of getting screened, um, did it move from 55 years down? Yeah, I want to say it's 40 now, right? So that's really good. Um, and then, but then there's factors like if you're a black man, if you have a family history, I mean, there are other reasons to get screened even earlier, are there not? Yeah, yeah it's also, you know, in all cases, if there's a family history, you should certainly be getting screened. Um, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but that's why it's so important to talk about things, right? Because if you don't, then you're not going to even know the history to, to be able to advocate. Um, but also that, Black men are twice as likely to be diagnosed and 2.5 times likely to die from the disease. So, you know, just being a black, being a man, right, but being a black man makes it much more important that you get this checked. And because in black men, the disease presents itself in more aggressive ways and, and, it, and it remains silent in its earlier stages. So for all those reasons, you need to go to the doctor. If you're not 40, I would say still go, still go to the doctor because, you know, while I'm talking about prostate cancer specifically, the overarching message is you need to be going to the doctor because you can't get screened unless you go to the doctor. So you need to be going to the doctor to get a baseline in terms of your health in general. But as a man, you definitely should be getting your PSA check. And if the doctor doesn't you know, do it, you should be requesting it. Even if you're not 40, it's nothing wrong with still, you could be 30, I would still say, get your PSA check because at least you have a baseline and you know, okay, well, if I was 30 and it was 0 0.12 or whatever, and now I'm 33 and it's 0 0.2, that's letting me know it's going up and it's helping. And at least you can do surveillance. You can just kind of, you, you just, be, it helps you to be more mindful and to be more vigilant about your health. The truth is, because you remember I was, I was diagnosed in November and I had surgery in June. So when I was initially diagnosed, I was told it was stage one um, by that first urologist. And then after surgery, I was told that it was aggressive stage two. So it could be it could be one of two things. It could be that I was misdiagnosed at first, or it could be that it just progressed during that time. You know, and, and the way that I've learned what, what I've learned about the disease since then, it's plausible that it could have actually just progressed during that six month period. You were diagnosed stage one. You opted because of life and, and other things. To, yes. Okay, June's a good time for me. Yes. I guess, how about this? What went into your decision-making? If you could go into that a little bit more, like what, what was the importance of weighing? Like I need to get whatever's going on in there out now versus- Yeah, now? I mean, and my urologist, my team of urologists had actually advised me. They told me because, you know, we're in the earlier stages and my health and all these different factors that I was in good shape and that they felt comfortable, you know, they wanted me to do it within a year from diagnosis, but I chose to do it in six months because I probably could have done it sooner, but I chose six months because that was during the summer and I was off from work. And I, that, that was the reason I chose to do June. Um, but I could have done it later. Uh, I'm glad I did not Um, but, but my urologist had told me like, you'll, you'll be fine. Like we don't, we don't suspect that it'll escape, you know, the prostate in this time and metastasize. So um, that's why it wasn't a real urgency to do do it like 
you know, December or January, you know, because I was told that as long as I do it within a year that I'm good. So yes. let's talk about going into the, the surgery. Um, what, what would you like to tell people about, you know, <laughs> about that? Oh, man, that all, I don't know if sometimes when things are just so traumatic or stressful, it's just my mind just, it doesn't allow me to be as rattled as I probably could be. I mean, it's not like I was going in there happy, but I just, I mean, I had my family with me, you know, I felt comfortable that my parents were there my brothers came like everybody who I loved was there so that helped a lot um so I would definitely say you know make sure you have people who you care about you know there to support you because that does help you know when I opened my eyes and saw those people around me that did help because I knew I had a long journey ahead of that you know like you know um they told me that I woke up you know cracking jokes the day of surgery wasn't really stressful i mean it, it felt like everything moved fast like i had to go the, the day before surgery to do like pre-registration or something like that and i remember after that you know i just it was like okay we just got to do this and i remember getting there that morning and my daughters were with me and we were laughing and you know i just remember honestly right up until the time when they told me like okay we're going back to surgery i, I really remember just laughing with my family and just i mean i know i was nervous but i just thought not to stay in that space. Do you remember, um, like, did you have questions for your surgeon beforehand or for your urologist in terms of, okay, I'm getting my prostate taken out, you know, even more than just the, the impact of the actual surgery physically, but like recovering from it, changes to the lifestyle. Like, did you have questions? They had done such a good job. They really did a fantastic job with like preparing me. Like, it's just, so up until that point, I mean, the day of surgery, I had learned so much through them. And then um, I wanted to touch on, because I remember you asking about the period between diagnosis and surgery. You know, during that time, I had uh, connected with um, US2, which is an organization for prostate cancer survivors, and they have a chapter in Austin. So I had learned a lot through them as well. So I can't remember any questions that I might have had that come to mind. I really don't remember. No, I don't remember asking any questions right before surgery. I felt so comfortable. And I think that goes into the comfort level with the your with your doctor or your HCP. Like, because I just I, I had no doubt, you know, I, I just knew before even before surgery, I just knew it was going to be a success because I knew without a shadow of a doubt, I was in good hands. What made you feel that so strongly? Like I'm all about, you know, how we engage and you know how we, you know, deal with one another. And from the minute I met that second urologist it was so evident that he was on my side. He, it, was, it almost felt like I was his only patient. If I can just explain it that way, honestly, I just felt like he didn't have any other patients to see after me. He was just really locked in and listening to me. And, um, and I think all of that really helped. I, I feel that that changes the trajectory of the healthcare experience when the patient has the, that real authentic connection with whomever they're, you know, whether it's a, urologist, cardiologist, any doctor that they have to deal with, because certainly in my culture, there's, there's, there's a nervousness there. Like, you know, it just comes from so many years of mistrust, right? And so doctors, more doctors need to be intentional about how they engage all patients, right? But certainly patients who look like me, because we know we need to get over that heel of mistrust. And, and I just think that Dr. Giesler, who is my urologist, who I love, I mean, and I, I talked to him to this day, um, I think he did that so well. Sometimes I think doctors don't want to engage patients or maybe they think they're opening a Pandora's box of questions, but actually I do feel like it creates more stress and anxiety and more questions when there's not that listening, when you don't get that experience. Yes. Yes, yes. It makes you, yeah, I think as a patient, certainly as a Black man, like, prime example, um, I, I know a patient who I've had to uh, deal with, and the patient actually feels like they never had prostate cancer. They feel like it was like they were, uh, they feel like they were like being used as like a project or something. But I genuinely, I, I'm sure they did, but I'm just telling you they, they feel this way. And it's primarily because they don't trust the doctor. I wanted to touch on a patient who I know who 
who had prostate cancer as well many years ago and the patient has expressed to me that he doesn't actually think he had prostate cancer he feels that he really feels this way he feels that he was being used as like a you know, a lab rat or something like that. And we know that that's a real thing, right? Like Tuskegee, you know, that's a real thing. And, and in a lot of men's mind, they still feel that that holds true today. And, and I'm not here to say whether it does or doesn't. I don't believe it does. Um, but my point with this patient is, I'm pretty sure that the reason he feels this way is because he has a severe mistrust of who his urologist and the, urolog the, the team he was, he doesn't trust them. He thinks that they and I often wonder if he did have a trusting relationship with them, would that change how he felt? Would he still feel that he didn't have prostate cancer? Because I just, that's such a, I've never heard someone say that. And, and so because I know that he has that mistrust, I'm pretty sure that's what makes him feel that way. I mean, that is so powerful. And, and we're going to dive more into Tuskegee later too, as we talk about clinical trials, because that's a whole nother, yes. I know, whole nother yes. animal here. Like, and so let me ask you, Michael, after the surgery, how long did it take to recover physically? Um, so I will say, you know, um, so after surgery, I, I believe I had to wear the catheter for seven days. For me, the catheter was the worst part. <laughs> it's just, I, it wasn't fun. Um, everything else I could deal with, the catheter was terrible. So on the seventh day, I remember that I had to get the catheter taken out. And this is just to show you, I, I'm pretty sure this is, I'm pretty sure it has a lot to do with the fact that I'm healthy and I'm younger, but the catheter, yeah, that was the, that was the worst. And, I, and so then after that, um, I mean, I was fully, four, like four weeks, I think I was back at work. And, but after seven days, it, it went out, you got, got yes. taken out. And then how yes. long did it take to recover from every, so four weeks you were back at work, but, and yeah. so you could walk around. Um, I would say six weeks, like six weeks back to norm, or, you know, like nothing's hurting or not. Yeah, I would say six weeks, six to maybe seven, maybe. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to address to help men understand? Like, look, there is a recovery period, but you recover, like... <laughs> I mean, you know, and I do want to preface that like every patient's story is different, right? Like, you know, you might talk to another, I've talked to other black men patients who were maybe three or four years older than me. And maybe they were, maybe they weighed a little bit more, like they, their outcomes were a little bit different. But for myself, um, as I said earlier, I've, I've, I go days without remembering that I had prostate cancer. Like everything functions on me the way it did. Like I don't have, I don't wear I don't have um, issues with incontinence. I don't, nothing. No, I've never had to wear a diaper, none of those things. And I'm, I'm saying that hopefully just to inspire men to like go get checked. I'm, I'm telling you all the, the, the positives about my specific scenario just to motivate you to go get checked, you know, because if you do have cancer or, or anything else, it's always better to know earlier than not. You know, we just have to get away from assuming that we can just ignore it and that it's just going to resolve itself because that's not the case. But you can still have an amazing life, <laughs> wink, wink, <laughs> after, after, you know, after, after a diagnosis or after surgery. You know, uh, I've been disease free since June of 2019. And, and I mean, I've never felt better. That's it. You, you are such a testament to the power of getting it caught earlier on. Right. And yes, you, yes. you, you, and credit to you, even though you weren't aware of the PSA and prostate cancer, you know, you're 37 and you were already going regularly to the doctor. So you were putting yourself in a position where you could at least mm -hmm. maximize the chance that you could. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I tell people too. So, I mean, I still had a part to play in it, right. Because I went to the doctor you know, yeah, it was a blessing that it was this particular doctor, but it's still the fact that I went, that I was, a, that it was able to be discovered. Had I not gone, you know, so you got to get there. You have to get to the doctor. Michael, to really, you know, what you've devoted your life to now, which is in particular, I mean, it's prostate cancer awareness, it's talking to patients, it's elevating the awareness in general, um, but in particular, spotlighting what this means for Black men, which again is so, so critical. And I know the, the numbers range, like Memorial Sloan Kettering puts it at like, you're 50% more likely to develop prostate cancer if you're a Black man, uh, but it goes all the way up to almost 2%. And then, but, but the other number that's more sort of in the same range that people agree on is that you're, you know, twice as likely to die from the disease, which is like, that's when I read that, I remember 
if family health history had been discussed, then I would have known about prostate cancer. And as a man, I could have, because I was going to the doctor, right? So I could have just added that into the conversation at my doctor visits. When, it, when health history is brought up, just like I was aware of my aunt having breast cancer and my grandmother having um, breast cancer stage four, and I shared that with the doctor, I could also share the prostate cancer. So it's just very important that we, it's key that we talk about it in families, right? You know, me as a prostate cancer patient or survivor, I make sure everyone in my family knows that I have prostate cancer, you know, so I have a twin brother and an older brother who have still not gone to the doctor. So I, I, do, I speak out for them, you know what I mean? Because it's so, I tell people all the time, it's so many people just like my brothers, you know? I mean, they, they, they know, my brothers know I mean, I had prostate cancer and they came to my surgery. So they know, and they know, they know now that our uncle had it. So my twin, he knows that because we're genetically the same, that makes him at an even higher risk, but yet they still haven't gone, you know? And I've had people asking before, like, well, why do you think that, why do you think it is that men don't want to go to the doctor? And really, when I think about it, I just think the response, the only word I can think of is just a fear. It could be a fear of the unknown, a fear, just a fear, just this fear. Like, I don't want to be poked and prodded on. I don't want people asking me personal questions. I don't want to have to, you know, have anyone in my intimate space like that. It's all these factors, but our health, meanwhile, you know, there are questions lingering with your health that go un, undealt with because of the fact that this fear continues to keep you frozen. And so me, as a Black man, as a prostate cancer survivor, I'm just here to tell men everywhere, but certainly men who look like me, that doctors are here to help us like they are. If you go to a doctor and you don't like the way they make you feel, you I want you to know that you have every right to find another doctor. You shouldn't have to go to a doctor that doesn't make you feel comfortable. And it's also okay to, you know, make speak up when you're in doctor's business if you if you feel that the doctor's not i mean if a doctor is not you know meeting your needs and meeting you where you are you you need to know that you can certainly speak up and make the doctor aware of that and if the doctor's still not being intentional about meeting your needs you have every right to to seek out another doctor and that's just something that i really want to make sure that i camera home because a lot of people don't realize that we actually as the patient we actually have the power you know we have more power than we think we do and certainly in, in black community and I always say you have to teach people how to treat you and the same applies when you're with doctors you know let's not be afraid to advocate for ourselves um, in the healthcare space and to speak up and and ask questions and and let's let's so that we can change the narrative thank you for that um, you know, in talking, I know you've probably had so many of these conversations, but I, I do want to delve a little bit into your own brothers, right? Like you said, they, they know they saw you went through surgery. Um, there's the fear that's behind it. What you've talked to so many people now, is there something you feel like is the best way, the most, what's the most potent way we, as like humans, as a community of humans can tackle this? I think in order to, to tackle, there's two things. So first, you know, doctors, there needs to be more like unconscious bias trainings and different trainings so that doctors and healthcare providers have the tools and they know how to engage the black patient, right? Um, but then on the patient side, I think that it's going to take the community churches, you know, this is something that needs to be talked about in church meetings, fraternity meetings, you know, in places where black people feel most comfortable um, so that they because that's going to essentially be what's going to get them there. And they also need to be hearing it from actual patients, like actual Black men who, who, who went through this, who are survivors and can speak to, you know, the, what, what it might look like in terms of the journey and, and, and just speaks to the, the point of, please go get checked, early detection. Um, so I think it's two things, because once you know, we can get them there, right? We can have the church meetings, and but once they get there, we need to be assured that doctors are going to know how to engage them in ways that's going to, it's not just the start, right? It's the stay. 
That's right. And I love that. It's yeah, we, you can do all this work to get people to go to the doctor, but it's going to fall by the wayside. If at that point yes. they feel like it's falling on deaf ears again. And it, so, and it might even be worse because it's going to be like, Oh, you got me here. And now see, this is why I don't even go to the doctor. And then you will never hardly be able to get them to go after that, you know? So you have to be very calculated in how we make sure that this is like a combined effort for sure. What are some tactical, and I know this is N of one, meaning that this is your voice, but but you look, you've talked to a lot of people and you have your own perspective to work from. So yeah. what are some tactical things? When you say doctors in terms of engaging patients in a better way, black patients in particular, what does that mean? Yeah, just understanding how we communicate and um, you know, um being able to being able to understand that the connection piece is critical, like you know. It, there is this cloud that that is sort of looming over healthcare, right? When it comes to how Black people perceive the healthcare, you know, any capacity of healthcare, and so the HCPs and people on that side must be vigilant and vigilant, diligent about making sure to, you know, turn flip that, you know, and flip that in their daily in interactions when they're meeting with patients now. The thing is, that's not just going to happen overnight. That's why training is so important because some doctors need to be trained in how to do this. So when it comes to like tactical recommendations, I mean, you know, how would that look? I mean, you know, maybe there's pamphlets of things that are that are provided to HCP so that they understand, you know, just little tips and tricks and ways to kind of engage the Black community because that's, you know, getting them there is half the battle, but keeping them there is probably the bigger part, the bigger part. And so yeah. you had said like, that was a great suggestion. One walk into the room, talk like, like a human being, like, Hey, Ooh, how's what's it going? Up? I like those shoes. Wow. Hey. I like your hair. You know, just, I don't know, just like the, I think a rule of thumb is to treat patients like they're your parents or your family members. Even if we're, even if they're clearly, we're not of the same culture, you know, because I think most black people are just in, a, in that healthcare space. We're tense, we're uptight. We don't know what to expect. You know, my situation is a little bit different because I've been going to doctors longer. So I don't feel as, you know, but there's still always, you know, I'm always wondering like, am I gonna, it's gonna be a good experience. Is the doctor gonna treat me like a person or like a patient? Yes, we're gonna be a patient, but we wanna be treated like people. I think that goes for all of us, right? It does. And I, but I think your, your point is, is really heard is that just acknowledge that in general, be, you know, be human with patients, but that there are particular patient communities, people, different communities, just in general, who are going to have more of this lack of trust because of historical reasons. You talked about Tuskegee, that was very real. People know about this. It was experiments that were happening that were, you know, really, I mean, like killing, you know, essentially, yeah. um, black men yeah. and, and, and devalue in, in kind of messaging, like we don't value, even when we had, you know, penicillin developed and nope, but not going to tell you, we're just going to keep this study going. So of course there's going to be a lack of trust yes. and just acknowledging that that's real. Yes. And, and even, 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 maybe not every patient, but you know, when the doctor feels that this needs to be stated, you know, maybe there's still a little bit of a disconnect, you know, it's even okay to say, listen, I know you may have had bad experiences before, but not here, you know what I mean? And like declaring that, you know, cause that's one thing, but then following through in your actions, that can be enough, honestly. I love that. You, I was going to ask you, I mean, just, would it be worth just even acknowledging, right? Like the acknowledgement goes a long way. It does. It does. And I think a lot of doctors might take it personally because they feel like, well, it's not me. Well, and I think most people realize it's probably not you, it's the system, but this is how you could separate yourself from the system and say, you're here with me now. I'm going to take care of you. I don't know what happened to you previously, but you won't have that here. That is really powerful. Um, thank you for sharing that. The, the last thing I want to touch on, which is really important too, and I know you talk about it in your work, is the clinical trials piece. Because as we know, clinical trials um, are experimental drugs, they're study drugs. Um, but when you're developing these things, if you're not, if you don't have, you know, like it's not inclusive. <laughs> Yes. Then the drugs yes. you're developing, the response, we just don't know the efficacy, how effective it's going to be, the side of like the impact on you in terms of side effects. And yes. so can you talk about that? Because what, first of all, what did you know of clinical trials? Like when you heard clinical trials as a patient first, 
you know, what were your thoughts? I didn't know. I mean, I, I mean, I knew what clinical trials were, but I didn't know the inner, you know, how it all worked. I, I was I wasn't up to date on all the particulars, you know, I mean, I knew in general what clinical trials are, um, but I think there needs to be so much more work done in terms of educating the black community on clinical trials and providing access to the clinical, because a lot of black, they don't even know, there's so many clinical trials, like you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and there's tons and they'll show you, but so many people don't know that, you know what I mean? I mean, I only learned that, I won't even tell you rather recently, providing access, making people aware that that website exists just for one, you know, um, because it, like many other things, it makes the Black community feel like we're being purposely left out of these clinical trials, you know, and like, I would say certainly, you know, at the, at the HCP level, you know, in the doctor's offices, some sort of advertisements are, did you know that clinical trials are available, even, you know, you're just providing the website so that people can, you know, look through that on their own. I just think so many people don't know that clinical trials are available and that Black people can participate in. When it comes to clinical trials, I will be communicating to Black men and Black women that it's important that we have a seat at that table, right? So that we are, you know, able to do our part in, you know, in the research phase of the, these different medicines to show, you know, how they can help our community, you know? Um, and, and just as a prostate cancer patient, as a Black person, I would just, you know, tell Black people in the community that, you know, yes, Tuskegee happened. Yes, Tuskegee did, definitely did happen. We honor that, that's, you know, but, but it's important to know, you know, what clinical trials are to understand, you know, how beneficial they are and, and, and to know that that's not really a likelihood now. We, we, you know, we've, moved, we've done so much better, you know, in terms of, you know, education and awareness and things of that nature. And, you know, while Tuskegee did happen, like we, we must do our part in ensuring that it doesn't happen again. And the best way to do that is to show up. Any last thing you want to say as a message to people who are watching and, and, and reading this? Um, to, to people who are watching this, you know, if, if, always look for support. You know, if you don't have any family support, you know, in terms of prostate cancer, there's, there's support groups, there's mentors that, that, that can be provided to you. But you know, again, my my reality is prostate cancer, but I want to really, you know, reiterate that healthcare is of the utmost importance. You know, if you're going to get your just get your general health up, you know, make sure you know that you're aware of the latest as as it relates to your general health. You know, and if that includes, you know, maybe they're realizing that they need to do surveillance with regard to prostate cancer or breast cancer, do what the doctors tell you to do, please. Don't ignore what they're telling you. You know, if you've gotten a diagnosis, don't ignore it. You know, we, we're, we're not, we got to get away from that. We've got to get away from, you know, I grew up in a Christian household. I love God. I know God. But I also know that God put doctors here to help us. And, and, and you know, God, God wants you to depend on him, but he wants you to depend on people he's placed here to do the job as well. So, you know, the best thing I can tell you is, is quite simple. Go to the doctor. And now you've become this like ultimate educator, right? Like you had this past as an educator in a different space. And like, how does that feel? That arc of. <laughs> when I, when I was diagnosed in 2018, I could have never imagined that, you know, I'd be, you know, doing this work professionally now, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, you know, meeting with doctors and I'm talking to doctors and I'm working to spread awareness on a national level. And that's just like a feeling that I can't explain. It's like, um, it's, you know, able to, that I'm able to transfer my skills into this space, you know, having been a teacher for so many years and, and, and still actually teaching in higher ed. So it feels good to merge my passions, um, you know, with, my skills essentially it feels really good to do and do this work and to be alive and well enough to do it